Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being here and talking about such an amazing subject as being together in Christ and together with Christ. It's good to be here, of course. The um, food here uh, is good. The uh, pool table is good and the table tennis. The lake here, all very nice. I'm sure the beds are very comfortable when we get to that stage. But it wouldn't be much fun being here on our own, would it? The real value of it is being here together. And that's the subject that we're taking, together. And you can't be a Christian on your own in your back bedroom. Sometimes people say to me, oh, I don't really need church because I can be a Christian on my own and I feel closer to God when I'm out for a walk with the dog in the, in the woods. Or, uh, that's, that's good. You can talk to God when you're doing that. And you can enjoy nature, you can enjoy all the things he gives you. But the Christian life as Jesus describes it, and I'll give you a clue, Christian means following Christ. So if you want to be a Christian, you've got to follow Christ and do the things that he says, otherwise you're not one. Um, but the, the, the real crux of it is, what's the life that's described in the Bible like? And it's not just, however good your relationship with God is on your own, that's just a small part of the Christian life, because the Christian life is a life together. And we're told in the Bible to do various things to one another. Thanks very much. And I've grouped them together um, as the A to Z of what the Bible commands us to do to one another. I'm just going to work through them. And at this weekend, we're going to do these things. We're going to do everything. We're going to aardvark one another, and we're going to zebra one another. We're going to go right through these A to Zs. I feel sure of it. So, so I'm going to go through these. We're going to abound in love for one another. We're going to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, if Steve Oxley has anything to do with that. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to agree with one another. We're going to be at peace with one another. We're going to be kind to one another. We're going to bear one another's burdens, except Ava, who wouldn't even carry my bag from the car. Okay, next one. We're going to bear with one another. We're going to build one another up. We're going to care for one another. We're going to clothe ourselves with humility to one another. We're going to comfort one another. We're going to confess our sins to one another, perhaps. That's brave. We're going to do good to one another. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to exhort one another. We're going to forgive one another. We're going to greet one another with a holy kiss, but within reason. <laughs> We're going to have fellowship with one another. We're going to instruct one another. We're going to live in harmony with one another. We're going to love one another. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to serve one another. We're going to show hospitality to one another. We're going to show kindness and mercy to one another. We're going to speak the truth to one another. We're going to stir up one another to love and good works. Next one, we're going to submit to one another. We're going to teach and admonish one another. We're going to wait for one another. We're going to wash one another's feet, metaphorically speaking, at least. And we're going to welcome one another. So there's a lot of things that the Bible commands us to do to one another. You can't just do that on your own. The Christian life is a life together. And we're going to look at this through the lens of the book of Ephesians, which Colin's going to read to us, and Stephen and I will do our best to explain something of what it means. Written by the Apostle Paul to Christians in the city, the Church of God in Ephesus. And he'd been involved in beginning that church and planting it. And although Ephesus is in what's now Turkey, the people that we call Turks weren't in that country yet, in that part of the world. The, the Greeks were, and this was really Greek people, Greek-speaking, Greek cultural people that Paul was writing to. And he's reminding them of the blessings that they have in Jesus and the kind of life we're to live. But I'm going to begin at chapter 2, explaining a little bit about what they were before. Paul reminds them of what they were before they became Christians. And then they were made alive together with Christ. I um, don't know if you remember this song by ABBA. 
It's one of my favourites of theirs, The Day Before You Came. And it describes the kind of dreary way that um, the singer of the song was living before she met her boyfriend or husband or whatever. And at the end of the first verse it says, It's funny how I had no sense of living without aim, the day before you came. But Paul reminds the Ephesians of what life was like before Jesus came into their lives. And before Jesus comes into our lives, we are living without purpose. We are living without aim. And we maybe don't even realise it. But Jesus comes in and he makes all the difference. And he reminds them that they were dead. I don't know if you've ever seen that sketch. John Cleese has about a hundred ways of explaining to the shopkeeper, played by Michael Palin, that he's bought a parrot and the parrot's dead. It's an ex-parrot. It's shuffled off this mortal coil. It's ceased to be. It's joined the choir and visible and all the rest of it. Um, it's a dead parrot. Well, Paul has lots and lots of ways that Collins read to us the ways in which they were dead. And let's keep going through this. You were once dead in the trespasses and sins in which you walked, following the course of this world, following the course of the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Keep going. So you were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead, useless, as far as God is concerned. And dead to him. You didn't have a relationship with him. You were going through life without him. Following the course of this world, you were just doing maybe what your dad did, and he was doing what his dad did, and he was doing what his dad did. You, you're just doing like a flock of sheep what everybody else in the world is doing, without thinking about whether it's the only way. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil. So you're not just following other people off the cliff. Really, it's the devil that's leading, that was leading you that way. Children of wrath, you know, when we sin, there is punishment, eternal punishment, after this life is over. And we've got to take that seriously. It says that you were children of wrath and without hope and without God in the world. That's what you were, he says to them. He's just reminding them. That word without God, atheos, is the word we get our word atheist from. Somebody who is without God is without hope in this world. And he reminds them, that's what you were. Now I just want to say to you, if you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be your saviour, that's not what you were, it's what you are what you are and you need to do something about that and you need to do something about it tonight if you haven't asked Jesus to be your saviour you are dead in trespasses and sins you are still following the course of this world you are still following the prince and the power of the air you are still a child of wrath and will have to face that wrath one day you are going through life without hope and without God in the world this is Good Friday. We've got to start at the cross and our weekend together. That's where Jesus died for you. That's where Jesus died as if he had done all the sins that you've done and for which one day punishment is due. When Jesus died on the cross, it was for your sins and mine. I love him because he was not content for me to go to hell. He wanted me with him in heaven. And he took that punishment upon himself for you, for me, as he died on the cross. So that it could be taken away from us forever. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. I love those words when I read them in the scriptures. But God. That's what you were. But God. Not but you did something. We can't do anything. But God did something. You were dead in all those ways. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, 
in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. Together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God is rich in mercy. Mercy is when you don't get the punishment that you deserve. God shows his mercy to you. He's got great love. God loves you. That's what the cross means. The cross means God has great love for you personally. And so he sent Jesus to take the punishment for your sins. He's rich in mercy. And what we've read speaks about the riches of his grace. If mercy is not getting the punishment we do deserve, grace is getting all the blessings that we don't deserve. And God pours them out on us. Yes, God has great love for us. And so we're not dead anymore if we've believed in Jesus. We're alive. We've been made alive together with Christ. I'm going to keep going on. So here we are this Good Friday. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been crucified with Christ. That old self that has characterised you up until you believed in Jesus is gone because it's crucified with Christ. As far as God is concerned, that person is a dead man. And you've been given a new person. And it's that person who wants to please God. That new identity in Christ is who you really are now. I have been crucified with Christ in the life. I now live in the flesh, the song says. I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Based, of course, on Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Have you been crucified with Christ? I challenge you about that. If you are not saved tonight, you need to be. Please, will you come and talk to me afterwards, if you're not? If you've not personally put your trust in the Lord Jesus. We can help you with that. There's others here too who can just help you to cross over that line from death into life and begin this life together with Christ. Now, if you've been crucified together with Christ, your old self buried with him, it's so that your mind can be renewed and it's so that you can be raised up together with Christ. Together with Christ. Yes, crucified with him, but praise God also raised up with him, and seated with him in the heavenly places. Can you imagine the power it takes to raise up a dead man and seat him in heavenly places? That's beyond dynamite, isn't it? That's real power, and that's the power of God. And we see it, of course, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, but he invites us to be crucified together with Christ and to be raised up together with him, and then, having been raised up, to live together with Christ, to live a life with Christ at the centre. We've got a symbol for it, and some of you have done this. Um, James just did it last week. Um, I've seen James sitting here somewhere. Thanks very much, there he is. There's a symbol of that. To be buried in the water and come out to live a new life that's a symbol. Crucified, old life buried. Now I've come out of the water and I'm going to live that new life together with Christ. Have you done it? The precondition is that you've received the word of God. You've been saved, become a Christian, whatever you want to call it. You've done that and then you want to follow Jesus and so you obey his commands. I want some of you to get wet. And I want some of you to get wet soon, if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back tonight. I want you to do it because the Lord has commanded it. And it's a symbol of what's happened to you if you've been saved. To be buried with Christ, but to emerge, to walk in newness of life, to symbolise and tell the world that's what's happened to you. 
get baptised. We've been made alive with Christ, we've been raised with him, we've been seated with him in the heavenly places. God sees us as already there. That's how certain it is. You can't lose it once you've got it. God sees you seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now, who's the most powerful person on that picture? There used to be a thing called the Forbes list that um, talked about the most powerful people in the world. And the last time they did it, I think, was 2018. And they had Vladimir Putin in third place, Donald Trump, who was then the president of the USA, in second place. And they had um, the man who's pictured with the current president there, um, Joe Biden, president of China, Xi Jinping. He was listed as the first most powerful person in the world at that time. You might think it may be as the Pope or Jeff Bezos or some of these people. But we've read about a man who is more important. And it talks about us having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you might know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So that's Ephesians 1, the power that's been given to the Lord Jesus, who died and was raised from the dead and has been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And then in chapter 2, he says that we have been raised with Christ and seated together with him in heavenly places. That one who's in charge of us is far above all the names that are named. Far above them all. Keep going. Jesus. Far above every name that is named. We get a picture of it in the New Testament story of Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of the Lord Jesus who became sick to the extent that he died. And he was buried in a tomb. And the Lord was upset. He saw everybody around, including Lazarus' sisters, weeping and mourning. And we read that Jesus himself wept at what had happened with Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. There was no doubt about that. He'd been there. In fact, when Jesus told them to roll the stone away for what he was about to do, they said, no, he um, it started to decompose. The NIV very politely puts it, there is an odour. I love the old versions because it says, behold, he stinketh. And uh, maybe that will be an apposite to some of you in your dormitories or wherever you are, um, depending on how much you wash. But it says about Lazarus that they're all the stone away. Jesus commanded them to roll away the stone. And they said to him, behold, he stinketh. He will smell terrible. Well, why roll away the stone? But of course, Jesus had the power to raise even a dead man from the tomb. And he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. One day, of course, he'll shout and everyone who's dead in Christ will rise. And one day, all the dead will rise on another day that's coming. That's the power of Jesus. Lazarus came out in chapter 11. And then when we get to chapter 12, we see Jesus reclining at that house where his friends lived, Lazarus with his sisters Martha and Mary, and they're sharing a meal together. Yes, he's been raised from the dead and he's living a new life and he's living a new life in fellowship with Jesus. Imagine the privilege of that, sitting down, eating with Jesus. And that was the life that Lazarus had been called to. And so Jesus says to us, Behold, to believers, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So this Christian life is a life together with Christ. He's present and he's a reality in it. Together in Christ and together with Christ. So we're in Christ if we're believers 
in the sense that we are part of his body. We read about different, type, different uses of the word church in the New Testament, but the one that is focused on where we've read tonight is the church, which is the body of Christ. And every believer since he went back to heaven, wherever they go on a Sunday morning, or even if they don't go anywhere, is a member of that church, which is the body of Christ. So I'm not talking about the Church of God in Wishaw or Birmingham or Akrakumo or wherever. We're talking about not churches of God, but we're talking about the church which is the body of Christ. And I'm very thankful for it. If we're talking in terms of quantity, only a tiny, tiny proportion of what God is doing on this earth at this moment is being done by the churches of God. But... There's this church which is the body of Christ that every single believer is part of and has been, has been added to, if you like, constantly since Jesus went back into heaven. And there will be new members of it until the time when the Lord Jesus comes to take us home. Praise God for the church which is the body of Christ. And we ought to be interested, not just in what's happening in fellowship, but we ought to be interested in what the church, the body of Christ, is doing globally and what's happening in it. One thing you'll notice about your body is that you've got lots of different parts of it. You've got your fingers and your knees and your elbows and your epiglottis and who knows what else. And they're all different and they've all got a different purpose and a different function. This man here is all he is, but he... If the whole body were an ear... Where would the sense of smell be? You wouldn't be able to smell very much if you, if you didn't have a nose. Um, we, we all need each other, don't we? We all depend on each other. Don't you be jealous of somebody else because they've got a spiritual gift that you don't have. You've been given the one that you've got for a reason. And we all depend on each other. You can do things I can't do and I can perhaps do some things that you can't do. But we all lean on each other and we all depend on each other because we're all part of that church, which is the body of Christ. Tomorrow we'll hear maybe more about churches of God. And there are certain things that um, we have to be in churches of God to give expression to. In fact, if the churches of God didn't exist, it would be necessary to form them, to put into practice some of the things that are in the scriptures. So we'll hear about that. But tonight I just want to encourage you, you are part of a global thing called the church, which is the body of Christ. And that one who is more powerful than Jeff Bezos and the Pope and Xi Jinping and all of these other people, he is the head of that body. So the one who is the head of all things has been given to the church to be its head. And he is on the throne and he is our boss. And it's our job to follow the impulses and the instructions and the commands of him. God put everything under his feet and made him head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fulfills all in all. Are you excited about this subject? I am. And I think we're going to enjoy learning about this over the weekend. So, together in Christ, together with Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, tis my God, bless to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side. No.
loving kindness as a flood when a prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood 